Handler School of Theology is pleased to announce the launch of our new track on womanist discourse in our Doctor of Ministry program. As an institution, we are consistently striving to create well-rounded spiritual leaders equipped to serve in this consistently evolving world. The Womanist Discourse track, led by Rev. Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, Dr. Musa Dubey, Rev. Dr. Clea Williams, and Rev. Dr. Nicole Phillips, provides space for scholars to grow in their knowledge and understanding of womanist hermeneutics. We've teamed up with the Candler Foundry to present this six-part series on womanist discourse, aimed to give you an inside look into the scholarship of our amazing faculty and inspire you to join us in this work of liberation. The Reverend Dr. Teresa L. Fry Brown is the Bandy Professor of Preaching, a chaired professorship created in 1986 with a gift from B. Jackson Bandy that is considered by many to be the country's premier chair in homiletics. Fry Brown has taught at Candler since 1994, and in 2010, she became the first African American woman to attain the rank of full professor. She also served as the director of Candler's Black Church Studies program until 2015. Fry Brown's research interests include homiletics, womanism, womanist ethics, sociocultural transformation, and African American diaspora history, focusing on African American spiritual values. In addition to five monographs and four books, she's written articles and chapters for over a dozen more, including Delivering the Sermon, Voice, Body, and Animation and Proclamation, Can Assist to Get a Little Help, Advice, and Encouragement for Black Women in Ministry, and Weary Throats and New Songs, Black Women Proclaiming God's Word. Dr. Fry Brown's life is governed by the words of the prophet Isaiah, those whose hope is in the Lord gain new strength. And the words of Mohamdas Gandhi, we must be the change we want to see in the world. And now it's time for the episode. Dr. Fry Brown, welcome to Candler in Conversation. I'm honored and excited to just talk with you today. So welcome. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So we're here today to talk about womanist theology. I know it's such a big and important topic, especially as the doctor of ministry is preparing to launch this new program. Mm -hmm. But I really want people to get an opportunity to hear from you about your, I would say, grace-filled life journey. So my first question for you is, what is your earliest memory of womanism? Like, when did you know, I Uh, am a womanist? I think before there was even a category of womanist. I was raised with a strong maternal presence. My grandmother, my mother, all the women in my family taught me to stand for who I was, to not uh, be complicitous in my own destruction. That's agency, right? They taught me that I could be whoever I wanted to be. Uh, One of the tenets of womanism talks about uh, seeking to know more than you should. But they told me that the world was open to me. And so before the mid-80s, when the term womanist was coined, I think that there were generations of Black women who exemplified, and that's that's actually where the term came from. They looked at the women that came before them and said, this is what one needs to be, to be an independent Black woman, not away from everybody, but having enough of their own power in the world and to the word of Sir Vivio, to live above what the world wants you to be. So I think from the time I was born until the time I would watch my grandmother go in and out of church kinds of settings, my mother doing those things, my mother navigating uh, computers early on when computers first started and doing things that women were not supposed to do. And we were encouraged to, uh, Zora Neale Hurston says, to jump at the, jump at the sun. Mm. So for my entire life. That's 72 long years, right? (laughs) My entire life, that's what I was told to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you, and I'm going to ask a bit of this, just hearing from your work, especially getting to be your student in Intro to Preaching, Mm -hmm. you've talked about having to serve and lead in spaces that haven't always appreciated you Uh and appreciated your gift and sometimes tried to pull you out of it. So Uh for someone who's thinking about womanist theology, maybe even can I approach this doctor of ministry program? Mm -hmm. How would you help them quiet what you have sometimes called the loudest voice, which is your own self-doubt? Yes. I think the the self-doubt, the even with the background that I talked about from my from the women in my family, and I might say the support of men in my family, 
uh, navigating being a teacher when all Black women were supposed to be teachers, but I wasn't going to fall into that certain level. I knew that I needed to do higher education. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a doctor. And in the 60s, Black women were told they couldn't be these kinds of things. Um, and trying to find a, a niche for myself that people, when, even when people said I couldn't do it, um, being in ministry, uh, I was told when I was in one particular denomination that women should not do that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I was in my late, in my early 30s, then I found a denomination that welcomed women, and that was the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And so it doesn't mean I didn't learn anything from being in the Baptist Church. It means that this was an opening. It wasn't easy because I was the only woman in my class. Uh, when the men were told, you don't have to do X, Y, and Z, Teresa was told you have to go to school, you have to do this because the men need to support their families. Uh, going through uh, a divorce because my first husband didn't believe women should be in ministry and, and still finding people that I didn't even suspect that would be supportive of me. And there were women in the church who did not believe in women in ministry. And over the course of my first three years in ministry, I found that some of them had early in their careers, in their lives, wanted to be in ministry. The door was shut, and they resented my having a crack to go through. So it took some negotiating with women in the church also. And I think that if one is interested in uh, a womanist discourse, it is not just screaming, but our very presence shifts the atmosphere. Uh, because we're in spaces where we are not seen sometimes, that we are not expected to be in, and the rules keep shifting for us. Mm -hmm. And so one, I, do, I don't believe in that terminology of one has to develop a thick skin. I think one has to guard one's heart and mind mm -hmm. because the the daggers will keep coming. But if one is interested in studying um, womanist discourse, whether it's in theology or ethics or in practical theology like pastoral care or public policy, because there are also women in public policy and in other areas outside of the church, even though it started within uh, seminaries. I think that it helps to know that you're not the first one, mm -hmm. that you're not the only one, mm -hmm. that there are people following you that are watching, but also to never be in a position of thinking, I'm the first one that did this, and nobody else has ever done this. So part of womanism is very historical. Yes. It's reaching back, that Sankofa kind of situation that we do in the Ghanaian. But but it's it's to the Akan, it's to go back and say, what did these women face? How do these women with children? We have a whole generation of people that think they're the first ones with children going into ministry. <laughs> nope. <laughs> there were women that took their children with them or left their children someplace else. And I think it's important to know where we have been, the good and the not so good. And how I navigate may not be how you navigate, but there's someone that had to navigate something that you did. And then it's always looking at succession mm -hmm. because womanism is connected. And you have to name yourself. I can't tell you're a womanist. You have to name yourself however you see how you navigate in this world and determine which area you want to be in, what you want to do with your knowledge. But the succession plan has always been critically important. As my grandmothers pass things down to me, I pass things down to the next generation of women and men because... Um, I think sometimes our discourse, theological or otherwise, can be so self-centered mm -hmm. that it dies. Mm -hmm. And this is centuries of watching Black women, knowing Black women who were cast out because they were doing the man thing, who went through divorce, who went through sickness. Um, and so part of womanism is also in medicine also, mm -hmm. where we begin to explore how we care for our bodies. I'm in law school right now in healthcare, and so it's even looking at with my womanist sensibilities how Black women are taken care of, yeah. or looking at the percentages of what happens to us when we because people don't understand the pain, because from enslaved times forward, Black women are looked at as if they don't have a pain threshold. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're resilient. We're resilient. We'll bounce right back like yeah. a baby in the morning and get up and run in the afternoon, and and it's 
it's that's part of womanist discourse too. So it's not narrowly in the church, which I think is critical for people to understand, but it's applied in whatever spaces you name yourself with those traditional communalism where you can't do it by yourself, with your own sense of agency, with that's radical subjectivity, and in your critical thinking, because it's important for people to know that we have brains and we think, and we figure out puzzles. And whether we're given credit in the sciences or or in uh, how to set up a house or in childcare, whatever we choose to do, we have brains, we can think, and we depend on the wisdom of our elders, Mm -hmm. as well as the new kinds of ways of doing things of the persons that are following us. Something that Katie Janie Buchanan talks about, a a truth that that hurts, like it it literally hurts your teeth. Mm -hmm. It's grinding to be able to talk about certain things. Mm -hmm. When I was listening, I was listening to one of her interviews, and I remembered all of the hard but true things that you would share with us in class. And I remember Mm -hmm. at first, because I'm untr- I, I did not grow up in the church. Mm-hmm. I did not grow up in the academy. Mm-hmm. So when I came to Camden for the very first time, all of this was new. Mm-hmm. And I want to say, as people will see this, thank you for always telling the truth because mm-hmm. it has made me be able to navigate ministry and to yeah. understand even how to negotiate, to your point, with certain women in the church, men in the church, dynamics that are happening and existing. Mm-hmm. And I just remember I am not the very first one. I am not. I will not be the last. Um, mm-hmm. And it is by telling the stories. It is by telling the truth and and listening to the wise sages um, mm-hmm. that come before us that we're really able to 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 live and be in the fullness of who we are. God has called us to be. Yes, and I and I think it's to understand that truth is painful and healing. Mm. That for me, truth pricks a sore area, but it lets the infection out. Yes. So one can begin the healing process. And so even when one as a woman is speaks truth that Katie's talking about, that painfulness, sometimes you reject it, but you still have to speak it. Mm. Uh, because I think that also helps you when you enter spaces that don't want to see you, you're already prepared to know that uh, I only need a second. I can sit in meetings and not want to talk the entire meeting. That doesn't mean I don't know anything. It means that maybe I don't value the conversation. But, <laughs> but I also va- I learned to value my voice and my being enough that when I speak or when I'm present, it means something. Mm-hmm. That uh, when I say to younger women or women that are interested in, in women's discourse, my job is, as a woman, is, is to not always stand in front of you, but when I see you going towards something, I can warn you. Mm -hmm. And if you choose to keep going and crash into something, I'm going to stand over here with with alcohol and tweezers and everything and kind of help you, but I'm not going to say I told you so because you have to learn your own truth. Mm -hmm. Because we enter these things at different times in our lives in different spaces. You learn your own truth. I can give you some models, but you also have to set up your own. So I'm just sharing the information. So I'm not trying to clone you. Womanism is not about cloning people. It's about assisting, walking around, walking with people as they grow into the fullness of who God made them. Yeah. Being the person that sometimes, as you described, you're you're on the sidelines and you're ready and available to sometimes see that the crash is about to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fall convocation of 2016, you preached a sermon and you talked about the fatigue mm-hmm. of the, being a weary <laughs> prophet. Yes. Do you ever feel like a weary prophet in this work, and how do you manage that? Exhausted. Uh, uh, the sermon was uh, justice fa- on justice fatigue. Mm-hmm. I think that it's pain. The pain for me comes with knowing that I have fought this fight for a long time, and see that the enemy is still there. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, watching, I can anticipate some things when I'm working with younger women, and I, but they don't, they don't hear it. And the pain is, number one, did I work hard enough? But again, there were women centuries before me that set up some things. Did I work, did I work hard enough? And when will it end? That's the fatigue part of it. When I think about uh, 
young women in my, my daughter's age group or younger and what they're doing. And so on the sidelines, sometimes I'm just um, um, I'm fatigued, but I know I need to rest a little bit and then get back in the fray. Hmm. Because someone else rested a little bit and got back in the fray. Yeah. It's it's the, one of my quotes from Fannie Lou Hamer when people say sick and tired of being sick and tired. I like her quote that she said, I don't know when I leave the house in the morning if I'll return in the evening. But if I fall, we will be five foot four inches closer to the cause of freedom. Mm-hmm. I'm five foot four. <laughs> <laughs> and and so for me, it's we have to keep trying. And that's the hopefulness in the midst of fatigue, that someone is going to break through. And when that one person breaks through, that she has the wherewithal to bring others with her and not to go through and shut the door. That's the difference. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, I have so many, so many things. I'm like, how much, how much time do you <laughs> sit here? Um, with this podcast, the goal is always to be practical. Mm-hmm. So to be inspiring, of course, but also we want to leave people with real tips that they can use to go and start doing this work on their own. Mm-hmm. So for someone that's listening, who's maybe considering to start this this womanist journey for themselves, mm-hmm. what are three tips that you would leave them with today? I think the tips, uh, well, I'd love for everyone to come and study with us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the, the more practical tips are, um, I'm also a historian, is to know what happened before you were born to know who came before you, and to even start talking to women in your family who may not disclose all the hard parts, but look at some things that they did that they don't talk about all the time, just in normal kitchen table kinds of conversations, to know that. Uh, Begin to do practices, whether it's a therapist or whatever, to appreciate who you are Mm -hmm. in the fullness of your own identity. It, not trying to be anybody else, not trying to look like anybody else, but begin to, because part of womanism is to love oneself, mm. is to love these bones, this body, this fullness, uh, however you identify yourself, to see what happens when you're in circles of women. Are you the one that's always going along? Are you on the fringes of it? Or can you have honest conversations with people that you trust and to know that not everyone's your enemy? Even and, and, and to watch people. I think reading people or reading the room is essential for Black women particularly because just because we have an invitation doesn't mean we're welcome. Mm. And so reading that room when you walk in and the final thing you asked me for three, but this is my fourth one. Oh, oh please keep uh, going. <laughs> <laughs> the final thing is one of the things that has helped me over the course of my life is to have a circle of women that may be close, may be distant, of different age groups, different professions, different experiences, that when I'm at an impasse, I can call them, text them, email them, just sit on their couch and eat haagen and just veg. But to be able to find a safe, and I don't, I don't mean the, the, the little free safe space. I mean a, a place that you can be totally yourself and that what you are doing is confidential enough that you can you can you can regurgitate all the pain mm-hmm. and then they leave you alone so you can heal a little bit mm-hmm. knowing you're the only one that can heal mm-hmm. but people that I trust and I've been very fortunate to have people for 40 50 years that have done that for me that I don't have to talk to all the time but I they will sense that something's wrong with me they can watch me on a podcast and know by my eyes mm-hmm. that they need to call me. I can be preaching and someone will say, uh, they'll press something in my hand or they'll text me and say, okay, that kind of support, I think, particularly because this is the perspective I have to use for black women, is because the world sees us as invincible until they want to stomp on us, that we have to remember that we are living, breathing human beings that have pains and have ideas like everybody else. And the strong Black woman died a long time ago, if she ever existed. Mm. And so I think uh, those kinds of things are just things that start. And the last is learn to laugh. 
learn to, not the cynical laugh that I do sometime when I just want to punch somebody, but because <laughs> I do sometimes, but, but I think it is to learn to enjoy even small things in life. Everything is not so serious yes. because we begin to crack inside if we can't find joy mm-hmm. in, um, I have a, a 20 month old grandson and just watching him do things takes me back through a whole lot of things, but that kind of inquisitiveness that we lose because we think we have to be perfect. Yes. That we have to be on it all the time. We get up in the morning, oh, I got to face this again. And we put on the mask, as Claude McKay says, we wear the mask of skin and lies, right, that hide our face. And 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 it's being able to go into a situation and say, as the church song, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. Yeah. And the world can't take it away because we are, we are uh, and I don't think this is hyperbole, Black women are disliked. Black women are hated. Uh, Black women are, as someone even last semester said, I was overly aggressive and vicious um, because I spoke my mind in a meeting. And I think that we have to have an armor, but not to make us cold and calculating, but also a a protection, um, whether it's us or someone else with us, that allows us to go ahead and be the fullness of who God made us. And I believe that. Yeah. So we're not less than anybody. We're not better than anybody. We're just us. Yeah. And that for me has been the power of being able to name what I saw my grandmother do. Yeah. To name what I saw my mother do. To watch the women who made it and the women who did not, yeah. but kept striving. Yeah. So, yes. As as I'm listening to you, I'm hearing Um, an interview with Toni Morrison, Mm. and she says, I'm surprised that Black people are even alive. Yes. And I hear from what you just said that it's really that we need sacred community. When you said like this, right. this, this private place, this, this place where I can just be myself and I can open up mm-hmm. and I can trust what I say won't make it anywhere else. Then. Anywhere else. My house is my sanctuary. Yeah. I do not. I, I, it is it is decorated. It is it is. It's a place where I only invite certain people in mm-hmm. and I, and and there I have rules that we don't have status when you enter my house, that people take their shoes off. There's enough beds for people if they want to go to sleep, whatever. They can eat what they want to. Nobody monitors that. They can say what they want to as long as we're not cussing at people, fighting, and everybody has a voice regardless of age. Mm. That, that that's, that's my sanctuary. And so when the world seems to be blowing all kinds of things at me, it, it's, it's almost if I can just make it to my house. Yeah. Right. And I can just make it to my house. And and once that alarm is turned off, <laughs> because we have to think of everybody home. else out there. Right. Once the alarm is turned off, then I can I can find myself breathing differently. Mm-hmm. And those kind of communities that one forms in different places with different people are very, very important. And some of my community are men and some are women. And I don't have barriers about who's in my community, but there are people that I trust that allow Teresa to be Teresa and don't have to post it. Mm. That's the other thing. You, you, in my house, you don't post. You don't post. Yeah. You have to have permission from people because that's the sacrality of a sanctuary. Yeah. That we're not always trying to get hits, but we're trying to let people breathe and let people grow. And if people are crashing, like when I've gone through periods of grief when my husband died or something else, there were people that I knew could come and not ask me a thousand questions, but let me grieve at my pace. Yeah. And I think that engaging the world day to day, we have to grieve at our pace. We have to have these little way stations. Like Zorno Hurston says, I don't know why people don't like me. You know, I'm paraphrasing her. She said, I'm wonderful. I, I said, they're lost because they don't <laughs> like me. <laughs> and so sometimes you stand in the mirror and say, you know, I'm really great. Yeah. I'm just, I, you don't have to love it. I love who God has made me. Yeah. That's the power, I think, of womanist discourse. It's not to put anybody else down, but it, it is to be able to appreciate the godness in us, mm. to appreciate what we can give the world, and not always going around dripping pain. Yes. Because I think people like Black women when they drip pain. They like Black women when they're stereotypical, and they don't know what to do with Black women when Black women are at their full excellence level. Mm-hmm. So I'm not talking about red carpet, but 
if I get up in the morning and I haven't fixed anything, I'm a great Black woman, right? The world should appreciate this, yeah. right? And that's what, from, from, from my entire life, that's what I've been taught. Mm-hmm. And the pain comes when I have given my best and then someone says, you're doing too much. You know, when you're called, you're on team too much. Yeah. Krista, you know you're doing too much. You know you need to, you need, you need to sit down. You just sit down. Just, don't do that. Yeah. You, you're doing you this too to fast. Rest. You're doing so just rest. Just, be caught. But what I've what I've found over a period of my life, what that is, is not me. Mm-hmm. They're looking at what I'm doing and they know that they're not hitting where I am. Mm-hmm. So the best thing to do is try to destroy what they think I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so I just look at them, I go, okay. But this is who I am. So you either take me or not. But I have to work at the pace that God has given me. And that's part of the agency of womanism. Yeah. That's part of the the mother wit that was passed down to me, that you give what you can, you do the best you can, not to please people all the time. I'm usually afraid I'm going to let God down mm-hmm. because people's standards are so low. But I <laughs> very simple. <laughs> right. So you're amazing so, till you're not. You know, it's like, ah. Oh. Right. And 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 so I don't come at anything as a threat. I've said to, to men in churches over the years, when I've been executive pastors, as they call them now, used to be called assistant pastors, I said, I'm not here to take your job. I'm here, you gave me a job to do. I'm here to do the job. You're going to get credit for it. Mm-hmm. So if you want to have a brilliant, a wonderful, let me do me. And I don't have to have my name called. Because my satisfaction is knowing that Teresa did what Teresa needed to do at that time. Mm -hmm. In preaching, I don't compare myself to anybody else because I can only do me. So if you think I'm in competition, that's 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 yours. Mm-hmm. You need a therapist for that. Yeah. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, right? <laughs> and and so I think that for anyone interested in womanist discourse, there's a there is an appreciation for God's creation of black women. Uh there is a there is a there is um an ownership of our part of the beauty of black womanhood, there is also a production of knowledge yeah. that we don't need to forget. The production of knowledge right now in the United States, in the, in the academy, in seminary, some of the top biblical scholars in the world are black women. Theologians, we're in all kinds of areas. So we're also writing. Mm-hmm. And we are writing mysteries and we're politicians and we're doing all these other kinds of things. So there's a production. So it's not just keeping what we do for us, but it's also, it's there. It has been over centuries. It is there. Whether they stole our recipes or not, it's there. Whether they steal our designs or not, it's there. And so if nobody else knows, I mean, I find it very interesting now when I'm on social media, they'll say, well, did you know that the person that that designed Jackie Kennedy's wedding gown was a black woman? Some black women knew that, yeah. but the world didn't want anybody to know that. Yeah, And so we're, we've been producing. This is not brand new. This is not since the 80s. We produce all the time. We, I learned in the church when I had a wonderful idea, I learned how to give it to probably the person in the room who needed it. Yeah. You stuck gold star. <laughs> and, and I knew that I would never get credit for it. So one of my means of getting my productivity out is I give the information away. Because for me, it's more important that it's done than my name is attached to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the people that know me, the people have come to me before and said, that looks like something you would do. And I don't say, yeah, I did it. Because I still have to, I still have to give birth to these ideas, to the, to this creativity, to leave something in the world. The other part of womanism is when Katie Cannon says to do the work your soul must have yes. is... I do a variety of things. And when people say, why are you in law school? Because that's something my soul must have. It was denied to me 40 years ago, mm-hmm. and I'm doing it now. It's, it's my soul is to try, even when it's painful, to, make, to leave the world better than when I entered it. Mm-hmm. Even when I have the justice fatigue you mentioned, uh, that's the work my soul must have. Yeah. That's womanism in its finest. Yeah. And that is a, a special, I would say, heart work for you because not a lot of people would be willing to see the gift that God has given them mm-hmm. and someone else is walking with it. Someone else is, is, is living through the idea and maybe even getting credit and a, and a claim yes. for it. That is, 
That that is yes. a special humility. Even and I, I'm I, I'm shocked by you saying this because I'm mm-hmm. like I'm just thinking about all the accolades and amazing things that you've done. And mm-hmm. what you've just shared is that there's so much more that we will just never know. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I watch. I would watch my grandmother. Uh, people would come. By the, she would sit on the porch. And people would come. That's when people had porches. <laughs> and, and people would walk down the street, Miss Parks, Miss Parks. And it, it would be something we'd been talking about, or things I'd see her doing. And she'd say, have you tried this? And I would be, man. And they would go do it. Mm-hmm. The white family that she worked for, would, she would do the same thing for them. And at the end of the day, I would watch her sit back and just kind of sit and smile and go, hmm. And it was almost as if, a seed was planted in her, and as it was growing, she needed to share the increase. It's the it's the widow Zarephath, right? It's you're sitting there, you need these things. Something comes and gives you a little bit, and then it flows into the community. Mm-hmm. To me, that part of woman is is my community building, mm. and um, I do this a lot in classes. I'll come up and I'll say, "Oh, okay, I did this yesterday in something," and. Sometimes uh, this this goes, I'm not sure I'm the first one that thought about it, but I share it. And uh, I do that with young women preachers a lot and uh, people taking care of children. I just, there's so much that's, the overflow is so much that I, there's sometimes I'm talking to people and I'll say, you know, I have this idea for something. I don't have time to do it. Do it. Mm-hmm. And then, then the idea is out there. It was, it was, it was impregnated in me for, for a reason. And if I can't do it, somebody needs to do it because I don't want it to shrivel and go away. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think about, it's very hard for me to be introduced someplace because <laughs> I, I don't remember half the things that I've done. Not because I'm older. I yeah. just don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, and that's part of that, the community building, the traditional communalism, that's womanism is that um, we share. It's a common cup kind of thing. It's a, it's, um, I gave, I have one child, but I have millions of children. Mm-hmm. And it's because that's, that's the communalism part of womanist discourse uh, that you share. And they're not all black children. That's the other part. Because we're universalists, mm-hmm. that it means that we nurture the world. Um, however one identifies oneself, the, 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 the barriers that we see in some other kinds of discourse are dismantled in womanism. Um, and that to me was my grandmother saying, we're all ain't Haggy's children, mm. which meant we're all one. And it took me forever to figure that out. I was in my forties before I figured that out. Because I was like, man, you know, I'm going around protesting. I'm, you know, Black Panthers were my friend and everybody else. You know, I'm going to just kill everybody. Yeah. I went through that period of time. And I and, and my grandparents were like, they were just seemed so docile to me. And I was just, a hum- I was like, what? And and my grandmother hated my natural, but she never told me. She told my aunt. She didn't like that because, you know. Um, and I don't think it's a quote unquote politics of respectability. What I found out when I was 41 is that my grandparents desegregated the library in Sedalia, Missouri, because they wanted their children to have books. Their house was the house in Sedalia where students came from 60 miles away and slept on their floor so they could go to the black high school. Nobody had told me this. There's a picture in the library in Sedalia of my mother and my aunt and my grandfather the first day they got to walk in. So they did this kind of very behind the scenes, this is just what we do, we didn't post about it, that kept communities thriving. And they had six kids of their own. Mm. And and that's what I was taught, that you do that. You make sure that somebody gets another step forward. Yeah. yeah. And I am excited to see what this womanist discourse track will do, not only for the Candler community, but for, for the world, truly. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's a wonderful step forward. I think it will expand even how we think about theological education in this space. Yes. I feel like in the past 10 years alone, Candler has gone through so much transformation. Mm-hmm. And your leadership, your your voice, your willingness, I would say to say yes mm-hmm. to God's calling, even when there are days I'm sure that you're weary, you are tired, mm-hmm. um, 
and even misunderstood. For me, sometimes one of the hardest pains of ministry is being misunderstood Mm -hmm. when it's very clear that God is calling you to this specific thing um, and living in that affirmation even when others cannot. Yes, because often we're not, we're not, we don't have the language or the words to articulate what God is calling us to do. And other people can't hear that because it's the vision God gave us. Mm -hmm. The fatigue comes, it's like, God, you told me to do this. Could you just get them together for a minute so I can go and do my work? (laughs) And and so uh, going back to the, the fatigue comes, and then there are these little seconds of light make that, that make it worth it. Yeah. And then you'll go, oh, it's it's the the seemingly indelible injustices. And then you see one move of God. Not that God is not working all the time, but you see that one move. It's that one person that comes back that uh, I go out and I see students from years ago and Sometimes they'll say, I just gave you hell when I was in class and I didn't understand anything, but <laughs> Duck T, you know, you're right. And yes. And then it's time to move on to the next thing. But it's, it's the, even as we live in a world where there's instant gratification, one of the things that womanism has taught me, and it's in the biblical text, is I might not be present for the actualization, mm. but I'm there for the planting. Mm. Mm. Oh, <laughs> and and that, uh, even if I'm not present for the actualization, that I was allowed the privilege of planting, yeah, um, of tending for three to five years, of of uh, standing in pulpits all over the world to say something that God said, knowing that there were women that lived before me that could not even say a word in their own households, um to be invited places, uh, understanding even Emory's history. I mean, the 60s were not that long ago when you think about the whole life, right? When we weren't even on the campus. And I started out in the basement of Bishop's Hall next to a cooling tower, and there there was a storage room out in front of my office, so you had to navigate boxes to get back to my office. So I've had students that... uh, know where I am now, that they'll say, God was working all that time. And so there have been people that uh, will call me and say, you, you, you kept the course, and this is what happened. Where are you going next? I said, I don't know. But I think that's what uh, the power of Black women's voices, Black women's lived experiences, Black, Black women's even dying in the trying is mm. that the it, it, it is the uh, uh, being able to do things in this time period that my great-grandparents could never imagine. It is knowing that my grandson will do things that I can't imagine. It is doing the work not only that my soul demands, but what God commands for me to do when I can't tell anybody else what it is. That's the the, the foundation for me of Black women's lived experience, Black women's faith, Black, Black women's articulation of who they are, Black women's naming of self. That is all tied into the woman's discourse. And I think what was important for me for us to do this is not just because we have phenomenal women as scholars on, on uh, Candler's faculty, but also in Atlanta alone, is that such a this would allow a cohort of Black women to develop that sacred space we talked about. Yeah. To get some affirmation for what they want to be doing and to produce something, projects, what have you, that will help the next group, the next generation of people in this world that sometimes seems so absolutely fragmented Mm -hmm. and fractured that if we would allow, if we, if we don't keep, if we don't continue the articulation, if we don't continue the discourse, 
we will all just sit in corners and not exist. Yeah. And so to me, womanist discourse is life-giving. It has been my entire life. And I think the importance of this program is that it will allow that discussion. And maybe if it means that one person who thinks that Black women are useless are expendable, um, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, and that whole group also said, the fate of this nation is in the hands of Black women, yes, it is. which is why they're trying to take Black women down, ask Claudine mm-hmm. Gay. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, because they fear that uh, even the people that across the course of history in this country have had to nurture everybody's babies, they fear that we will have too much power, but they don't understand we already have the power. Yeah, You just can't see it because you don't want to see it. Mm-hmm. And so when we ascend to certain levels, there's a takedown kind of mentality mm-hmm. because they fear that if we can do what we're doing without names and positions, what in the world can we do if we had names and positions? Names and, positions? Mm-hmm. and so then the, the, the knee-jerk reaction is to find negativity about us. They don't like our hair. They don't like our bodies. They don't like our skin. They don't blah, 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 all these kind of things. Uh, as Stacey Abrams. Uh, they don't like who we love. They don't like how long we love. And so womanist discourse recognizes those things are there, but also it's a valuation kind of process yeah. where we support each other in the humanness that we are, but also the glorious beauty that God has placed in each one of us. So that's mm-hmm. important. I went off on a long tangent. Yeah, no, but that's no, what I do. no, no, no. This is this is this is so good, and I I want you to know that this moment for me is one of those glimpses of light. Mm. Um, as you were talking, I just a lot of times people say, "Krista, you're doing too much." Krista, you can't be bivocational. Mm-hmm. You can't be pregnant mm-hmm. and working both mm-hmm. jobs and mm-hmm. serving in the church. And, and, and I'm hearing uh, conversations I would have with one of the greatest theologians I've known, my grandmother, Mm -hmm. who never went to school, did not tell me until very late in life that she could not read. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. the way that she knew God, the way that she was able to convey life, Mm -hmm. um, that is womanist work. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I'm just grateful for your time, for your transparency, for everything that you've shared today. And I know that someone listening today is going to... Sign up for the Doctor of Ministry program. <laughs> we hope, we hope, we hope, we hope, we hope, we hope. Um, simply, simply from simply from hearing you, and and not, and not because they're chasing accolades, not because mm-hmm. they're chasing titles, mm-hmm. but because what you've shared with us is that this is true heart work. Yes, it is. This is God work. Um, this is work that will transform communities and generations. And I know that. The thousands of students that you have had, maybe hundreds mm-hmm. of thousands at this point, if we want to count social media, other people, right? Just, just, all, just all, all of the people. We are mm-hmm. blessed by your ministry and by your truth, and I'm just, I'm grateful. So, just thank you so much thank for you, your time. Kristen. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you.